Now, most of you, and this is particularly true, I think, of universities, are taught a kind of, at least a kind of implicit moral relativism. You know, that it's, that it's and that's fair, that's reasonable from a scientific perspective, at least to some point. But there's a problem with that because there are forms of moral presupposition that seem to lead to horrendous ends. And it's always struck me, because I grew up like you and under the shadow of nuclear destruction, so to speak, it always has struck me that if certain viewpoints lead to genocidal outcomes, and if they do that consistently, then it's extremely dangerous for us not to act as if that's wrong. And of course, if something's wrong, then that also implies that something is right, right? Because the opposite of wrong is right. And so even if you can't necessarily figure out what's right, you might be able to ground yourself to some degree by figuring out what's wrong. And so we'll walk through the philosophy and the psychology first, and then we'll walk through the sociological consequences of its abandonment, in a sense. And, well, then you can see for yourself if you think that this perspective is worthy of some consideration. It's very complicated. Well, we'll look at this first. Phenomenology, in part, is based on this idea of Dasein, and Dasein means being there. And again, this way of simplifying that is to think about it as your experience. And then, this is a map I've made of people's experience, which I think is at least roughly equivalent to the phenomenologist's design, and it has the advantage that I can explain it well, so I'm going to use it. And so the phenomenologists believe that the past and the present and the future are all tangled up together in your current experience, in that, say, everything that you're doing is related to the future, which it of course is because you're sitting in this class, and that has some consequences for whether or not you graduate, and that has some consequences for your status and your career moving forward and you're perfectly aware of that so that you experience the meaning of the, the lecture, say, in the context of your conceptions of the future. And of course the same thing is true of your experience now because of your past. And so the past and the future in some sense are here now. It's partly because when you're experiencing things you consider your current situation and you consider where it is that you're headed. And so Dasein also has this element of becoming in it. There's, you're not just a static thing. And you don't ever experience anything that's in your environment as something that's merely static. You always experiencing, you're always experiencing it in relationship to your plans for transformation. And that might be short term. Like maybe you're bored of the class because you need to go get a cup of coffee and, and that colors your current experience or maybe it's long term or it's medium term, it doesn't matter. The point is, is that your viewpoint of the future conditions your experience in the present. So in some sense the future is already here. It's also the case that what you do now is going to have effects and consequences into the future. Here's a, here's a more complicated consequence. So, you're somewhere now, and you're going somewhere in the future. And one of the consequences of that is that your <coughs> nervous system, it's one way of looking at it, parses up the world in relationship to the relationship between those two poles. So, for example, when you walk into a class, and your plan is to sit down, then you're immediately going to perceive an array of chairs. Imagine you were coming in here to clean up the room instead of sitting down for a lecture. Well then the things that would manifest themselves to you would be qualitatively different. So maybe you'd only be looking for the things that were out of place. Or maybe you're coming in here because you're spectacularly lonesome and you think that you know there's somebody here who might be a potential partner then the world's going to array itself in front of you in a different manner. And the degree to which what you're pursuing in relationship to where you are determines 
even how the objects of the world manifest themselves to you is indeterminate. It happens to a tremendous degree. And it's not only that things manifest themselves to you as objects in relationship to your conception of your current situation and your goals, but your emotions are also hang on that platform. So, for example, if you're writing an exam and you expect a C, you're hoping for a C, and you get a B, then you're going to be extremely happy about it, but if you are hoping for an A and you get a B, then you're going to be extremely unhappy about it. And what's interesting about that is that, in some sense, the stimulus, as the behaviors would have it, is the same, but the emotional consequence is actually reversed. It seems to me to be sort of related to the idea of maya, which is a Buddhist idea, which is that people live inside a framework that's conditioned by desire, and as a consequence, it's not actually real. And the, the, unreality, the unreality of it is that you can change what manifests itself to you and the importance of what manifests itself to you by changing your conception of your, of your goal, your future, or also by changing your conception of who and where you are right now. And so in that sense, being, your experience, is malleable. And it's, it's, it's malleable, at least in part, as a consequence of the choices that you make. And so what that implies from a phenomenological perspective is that free will and the manner in which the world manifests itself are integrally related. And from an existential point of view, it implies that you actually bear a fair bit of responsibility for the ongoing quality of your experience. And the existentialists would presume that that responsibility is built into the nature of being. There's no way out of it. It's like a precondition for being. 